Let's, uh, let's pray together. Do me a favor. It's all over the room. If you're praying with me, just close your eyes and put your hands in your heart for a moment. Holy Spirit, I'm asking that you would touch our hearts all over this room, all of those watching. I'm asking for the power of the Holy Spirit. Do what only you can do deep within us, what you love to do. I'm asking for the fire of your tenderness and affection, the truth of your commitment and zeal for our lives, for our future, for our destiny. I'm asking for it to go deep. Root us and ground us in your love today. Root us and ground us in your love in deeper ways in the days to come. God, I'm asking for the fruit of this conference, holiness, deep grounding in your love and affection. Let it take hold and not let go. By grace, we pray by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm talking about Standing without offense at the end of the age, I want to turn to Song of Solomon 5, Song of Solomon chapter 5. As you're turning there, I just want to emphasize there's many powerful ways to read the Song of Solomon, many powerful ways to look at the truths of this book. The way I want to look at it this afternoon, I want to look at it as the Old Testament book of Romans. I look at the Book of Romans as the New Testament Song of Solomon. The Old Testament Book of Romans, what I mean when I say that is the, the truths of the Book of Romans, the gospel that Paul lays out for us so beautifully. If you love the gospel, you have to love the Song of Solomon. If you love the gospel and the, the truths, the free gift of righteousness and the power of the grace of God working in our lives, what it produces in us, the Song of Solomon takes the truths of the gospel, the truths of the love of Jesus and the fruit of the grace of God, and it puts it to a song. It puts it to a story. This is the story of a young woman and how she grows in love and how she grows in the grace of God and what the power of the love of Jesus does for her heart and for her life, and how she grows in it. What, the reason I love it is because if you ever study the book of Romans and you study the truths of how Jesus loves you and what he did for you and how far he went to lay hold of your heart and to lay hold of your life, then you can actually look at her story. And I think of her story, again, in many ways, but I think of her story as a testimony of someone that has apprehended the truths of the grace of God, the truths of Romans and the gospel, and how she says yes, but it's the weakness and the brokenness and the, the, uh, the way forward isn't always so clean in the grace of God. The way forward isn't always so easy. The Christian life is a life that is filled with our mistakes and our compromises and our failures. But it's also filled with the love of Jesus, the grace of God, the joy of his heart, his commitment to us, and his zeal. On the other end of every failure, and on the, on the other end of every compromise, and on the other end of our brokenness and our weakness, every single time we look up, fresh from another failure, fresh from wondering if we can do this, every time we look up and we see his face committed, filled with zeal and jealousy and joy, and it throws us off at first because we don't understand how Jesus can be so committed and so fit and so gloriously stubborn in his commitment to our destiny, we feel so clumsy in walking it out. And he is so gloriously perfect in helping us at every juncture. This is what I struggled with as a young believer, and I'm sure many of you struggle with it as well. How is it possible that on the other end of my weakness and my failure, every time I look up, He's not angry at me, but he's filled with joy in his commitment to my holiness, my purity, and overcoming sin, and overcoming weakness, and overcoming brokenness, and overcoming every obstacle that stands between me and his love and our relationship, our friendship, and our destiny together. On the other side of my failure is this constant joyful Jesus, and it throws me off, and we think, how could that be? How could it be that you're not mad at me right now? 
He just wants to look at you again today in a fresh way. He wants to reassure you of something. Part of the reason why you get angry when you fail, part of the reason why you get angry when you stumble is because you feel powerless. You feel helpless. You feel stuck. He looks down at you and your weakness, your brokenness and your failure, and you're saying, how can, you, how can it be? Why are you joyful right now? I'm hurting over my weakness and failure. How can it be that you're so filled with joy and confidence? He'd say to you, here's the thing. You're angry because you feel powerless. I'm joyful because I don't. I don't feel powerless when I look at you in your compromise. I don't feel powerless, says the Lord, when I look at you in your weakness and your brokenness. I don't feel helpless, wondering what I'm gonna do next as you stumble forward, sincerely wanting to be free, sincerely wanting to love me, sincerely wanting to reach for me, and yet you fail. The Lord says, I don't feel powerless when I look at you. I know who I am, says the Lord. I know what I can do. I know the power of my grace and the Holy Spirit as I pour Pour love, Romans 5, over your heart by the power of the Holy Spirit. I know how effective my love is as you look at me again and believe me. I know who I am, and I am the best in the universe. I am the best that there is. I am the best leader. I am the best friend. I am the best God, I am the best there is in all the universe at taking your weak heart and bringing it into the fire of my affection and the confidence of my love and the joy of your salvation. I am the best there is at delivering you from sin. I am the best there is at bringing you into victory. I am the best there is at loving you. I know who I am. Your, your sin, your weakness, your brokenness, your immaturity, it's small to me and my love is huge and it's only a matter of time. We're in this together. I'm in this with you, and we're going to get through this. Okay, that's why you're filled with joy. You're confident in you. Her story. That's her story. One of the most enjoyable ways to read the Song of Solomon is to find yourself in her story. As you find yourself in her story, this young woman who starts out in the story, she starts out sincere, she starts out serving, she starts out wanting to do well and wanting to do right. And as she labors, her stumbling in the beginning of the story is she loses her way. As she pours out for others, she neglects to take the time to connect to Jesus herself. She neglects to take the time to reconnect to his love and his affection. All of those truths that I just laid out, she forgets them. Is anybody here in ministry of any kind? Is, any, is anybody here in any kind of ministry where you're loving people, ministering to people, praying for people, anything like that? And just raise your hand if that's you. A lot of you. Good. Well, you know what it's like. That's why it's so easy to find ourselves in her story. You know what it's like to pour out in ministry and serve people, but you look up, you didn't even realize it had been too long, and you disconnected from the love of Jesus in the fight, and you disconnected from his truth and his affection, and in disconnecting, you're pouring out, and over time, what happens if you stay there? The people that you're serving in ministry, you start quietly and secretly resenting. You start quietly and secretly. You get bugged by them faster. You get bothered by them faster. Their weakness begins to really bother you. Well, there's another little secret that happens as you disconnect from his affection and disconnect from his truth. Your own weakness bothers you more. You have less grace for your own weakness. You have less grace for others. You have less tolerance for people's dynamics and issues. You find yourself just wanting to run. And she realizes at the beginning of the story that that disconnect has cost her deeply. And she cries out in repentance. And the Lord finds her there. And he ministers in love to her in a beautiful way refreshes and restores her heart, which is what so many of you, it's why you come here. You come here in the fight. You come here 
uh, wanting to lay hold of something because, you know, in the fight, it's so easy to get disconnected. And some of you, you're limping into one thing, but with real faith and real hope, I'm going to find refreshing here. I'm going to find comfort here. I'm going to find truth again. I'm going to find his affections for me again. Some of you, you've been coming to one thing so long, you just know what's going to happen. I'm going to go. He's going to touch my heart. I'm going to get lit up. It's going to be amazing. But in the next phase of her story, he calls her back to ministry. And as she's staring at that place of her former compromise and failure, fear grips her heart. Oh, the last time I poured myself out in ministry, the last time I gave myself, the last time I went there, I really stumbled badly. Can't I just stay here in your affections a little longer? Can I just stay in the conference a little longer? Why four days? Why not a week? Can I just stay in the worship time? Can't we bring John Thurlow back out? Can't we sing a little more? I just want to stay here. I don't want to go back to the fight just yet. I'm afraid. I'm afraid of my own weakness. I'm afraid of my own heart. I'm, a, I'm afraid of what I'm capable of and stumbling. Can I just stay here a little longer? Of course, Jesus knows where your story ends. He knows what you were made for. He knows where your story's going. And of course, the answer is no. We know that, but we wish it would be the other way sometime. But he withdraws his presence and leaves her there and she feels the sting of it. She feels the sting of giving in to her own fear. But again, what's beautiful about her story isn't that she's an amazing super Christian who always does 40 day fast perfectly. And you know that person in the prayer room or the, or the church or the home group? How are you guys doing today? You know, it's the one person that's like, oh, you know, I'm not doing great. I'm just, I'm just fighting my way to feel the love of Jesus again. How about you? How are you doing? Oh, man. I was in the rapturous presence of his spirit for seven straight hours after my 40-day fast on water and manna from heaven. <laughs> oh, man, I hate that guy. <laughs> I love the Song of Solomon because it's a real human being who really wants to love Jesus but is really bad at it. That's our story, everyone in this room. We really want to love Jesus. We really want to love him back. How, how could we not? He's loved us so well. He's come again and again and again. And he's touched our heart again so many times. We didn't deserve it, yet so many times he reminds us he doesn't do deserve. He does mercy. He does grace. He does affection. He finds us again. She turns, she repents, he finds her again, and this time in her repentance, he pours out love and affection. He tells her who she is to him. He overwhelms her with the truth of how he sees her. It's almost more than she can take. She is captured. She is undone. And now we're coming to the part of the story that I want to focus on, her story. This is the part of the story I look at. I go, I want to get to this part of the story. The part of the story in which she's so overwhelmed by love. She's fully his, but she doesn't know it yet. There's a time of testing coming to her life that isn't, a, isn't the, uh, how we think of testing. We can think of testing and trial and trouble. We can think of it in very negative ways, but this is a positive thing. The Lord knows where her heart is and how sincere and real and true her affections are, and there's a test coming her way that's going to show her what she doesn't know yet. Her love is deep. Her love is real. Her love is powerful. It's a fruit of the grace of God. This is where I want to go in my own life. This is the dream of my heart, this chapter. My prayer is that this would be the dream of your heart as well. It's the answer to the question. The great question that I, I pray is the fruit of this conference for you. How far can I go in the grace of God? How far can the grace of God take me? How far, how, where does this go for me? And again, this is a very tangible, practical, real answer. What does real mature love look like? What does being tested and refined, coming through on the other side, what does it look like to love Jesus well? 
Is there a picture in Scripture that shows us where we're going? Where is the grace of God taking us? Is there a destination? I, I find that in the charismatic world that I'm in often, the destination seems to be power, 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 more, 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 stuff happening, crazy things, crazy testimonies, crazy stories. The reason I love the Song of Solomon, because I love all those stories. I love stories of power. I love reaching for the power of the Holy Spirit. I love seeing more people saved. I love seeing more people delivered. I love seeing more people free. But in the Song of Solomon, you have this clear, vivid testimony. Here's what more love looks like. As you're reaching for more power and more influence and more favor as the Western church defines favor, why do I say what, as the Western church defines favor? Just sneaking a little point here. See, the way we tend to define favor, and by Western church, I mean me and all my friends. I'm not talking about those other guys that don't get it. I'm talking about us. We tend to define favor in a real funky way. We tend to, anytime we get more good stuff as we define good stuff, it clearly is the favor of the Lord. You know, some of my friends are like, I met a famous person, favor. I got into a cool place, favor. If anything cool happens to us, it's clearly the favor of the Lord. And of course, Paul in the book of Romans defines favor very differently. Paul in the book of Romans defines favor as when you were wretched in hatred of God, when you wanted nothing to do with him, he broke into your life, he found you, he set all of his love on you, he put all of his spirit in you, he fought for you to be with him forever, and right now, on your worst day, even then he can turn it for your good, related to your love for him. You have favor on your life from the day you're born again to the day you die. You'll never get more favor than when you hated him, he found you, and put a billion nuclear suns inside of you called the power of the Holy Spirit. He did it not because you deserved it, but because he loved you. That's favor. I like that definition of favor. How far can the grace of God take us? Where are we going together? And as you read the Song of Solomon, there's a parallel theme that you want to lay hold of, that it's not just my story and your story, but it's our story. It's the story of the church. It's the story of where the church is going. Ephesians 3, 16 through 19, rooted and grounded in love together with all the saints. The Lord is deeply interested in the story of his family and where we're going together. What's described in this book isn't just your destiny or my destiny. This is our destiny. This is our family story. This is where we're going. This is exciting. More power, yes. More influence, yes. More victory, yes. But together, the greatest destination, greater than all of that, Paul says, greater than all of the promises of all the other things that the Lord's going to do through the church, the promise of more love. It's the greatest promise he could set before us. More love. And then he tells us what it looks like and he shows us how we're going to get there. And it's beautiful. I'm going to say this at the end, but I'll say this at the beginning as well. We say this a lot around here. If you don't quit, you win. What are we talking about? If you don't quit, you win. What do we mean by quit? I, I don't think in terms of quit the faith when I say that. Quit salvation, quit Jesus, though that. So there may be some that are on that edge. I believe the Lord can help you. But when I say if you don't quit, you win, what I mean is quitting as defined by settling for less than what the grace of God promises us. Just deciding because you've been bit, you've been stung, you've been disappointed, you've been hurt, you've been wounded. The circumstances of life didn't work out the way that you wanted them to. You didn't lay hold of what you thought you were going to. Life didn't turn out the way you thought it would. And there's that quiet temptation, that subtle cynicism of the heart, that place that you kind of arrive to you, where you wonder, is all of this reaching and labor and sacrifice, is it worth it? Or can I just kind of dial it down, settle back, and kind of settle in right here. I can still claim Christianity. I can still claim the name of Jesus. I can still have Christian friends. I can stay out of trouble and mostly not sin. 
And yet, the testimony of this little, this woman, this Shulamite, this hero, the testimony is, here's how far grace can take you. Here's how far the power of God can go in your life. Here's the intended destination of his love. The intended destination of his love poured into your life with intensity is more than you feeling good about yourself. The intended destination of his love is you consumed by his beauty, consumed by his worth, consumed by his glory, undone and undistracted, connected in a way that cannot be shaken. The end of his love is glorious and rarely found. It's more than I like me. It's about I can't get enough of him. I need more. It's where he's taking us together. How far in holiness and beauty can we go? Such a powerful picture. The plans of God for us as believers in our lifetime and for the church at the end of the age. What does a mature church look like before his return? How does it get there in his leadership? The picture we see all throughout this story is a picture of prayer and desire and longing formed within her heart as she overcomes adversity, immaturity, compromise. She comes to this place, she prays, at the end of chapter four, she prays this unbelievably profound prayer. It's one of the most powerful and beautiful prayers in the whole word of God. She prays, awake, O north wind, verse 16 of chapter four. Come, O south winds, blow upon the garden of my heart that its spices, that the fragrance, that, the, that what grace has produced in me, that what love has done in me, that the fruit of the love of Jesus working powerfully inside of my heart, that you would blow the winds of your, the activity of your spirit, whether it be the north wind of trouble, whether it be the south wind of refreshing, I want the activity of your spirit and your leadership to touch my heart and allow what you've done to flow out of it. And that's a, that's a foreign prayer to our ears. What we want to pray most of the time is for less trouble, less adversity, less struggle, less difficulty. We want to pray that God would make all of that kind of go away and more blessing, more ease, more comfort, more recognition, more promotion, more good stuff as we think of it. And yet she's laid hold of a very different way of seeing the world. This is a powerful fruit of the love of Jesus and the way that it changes our perspective and how we think and what we consider important, what we consider to be that which truly matters. What matters to her is simply this. Whatever you have to do to bring me into the fullness of who you've made me to be, whatever you have to do to bring me into the fullness of your love, whatever you have to do for me to get more of what you've wrecked me with, if it takes hardship and testing and difficulty to produce more love in me, Lord, I'm sincere. She's sincere in this prayer. That's the power of it. She's not trying to be spiritual in, in the way that you might think of it. She's not trying to be noble. She is a hungry soul, genuinely looking at God and going, no, for real, whatever you want to do in your leadership in my life, I've, I've just done so much life with you now that here's where I'm at. I trust you. I trust your leadership. I trust where this is going, and I trust how you want to take me there. Everything you've done so far has been amazing in terms of producing love and desire for you, mature love. It's been amazing. So whatever you want to do, I'm here. If you want to bring south winds of refreshing, if you want to bring north winds of trouble, bring whatever. That prayer, I look at that prayer and I go, that is who I want to be when I grow up. That's who I want to be. That's the kind of prayer I want to pray. That's the kind of thing I, I want to say to the Lord with all sincerity. I don't want to run this American culture race of social and workplace climbing to some kind of American definition of greatness. I want greatness in your love as it's defined by your leadership and all that you want to do in me. Here's my heart, God. Do whatever you want to do. 
And what's intense about this passage is that the Lord does it. He answers her cry. He takes her seriously. And he brings the north winds of trial and testing to her life. He withdraws his presence. And great difficulty comes to her. It's intense. And in that moment, she's going to find out. And that day's ahead for us as well, I believe. We're going to find out in the season of testing and the season of trouble yet to come. We're going to find out when the presence of God isn't what we want it to be and the favor of God isn't how we thought it would be and the, and the circumstances aren't working out like we thought they would. And suddenly the question arises, what are we really in this for? What is our Christianity really about? Why are we doing this? Why am I sacrificing? Why am I pressing? Why am I reaching? Why am I fighting this good fight? Why really? Why really? It's not a question we often stop to ask. Am I really in this for love? Am I really in this to be loved by Jesus? Or am I in this for some little quiet satisfying of my ego and Am I really in this because I'm haunted by insecurity and wondering if I really am the real deal and I want to prove myself to me and others? What am I really in this for? Am I in this because I want my life to work? Am I in this because I'm lonely? What am I really after? In this little moment, this little window into this Shulamite's life, that question arises in her heart in a powerful way. Am I in this for love? Are we in this for love? Are you in this for love? Here's what's amazing. What's amazing is that the, the presence of the Lord lifts and the watchmen, her leaders, they hurt her, they wound her. And as they strike her, the, the most amazing response, she doesn't respond. She doesn't get bitter. She doesn't get offended. She doesn't get angry. She doesn't rage against them. Uh, I've been struck a few times and so have you. Here's the general pattern of how it works in our lives probably. I mean, it might not work this way in your life, but it's worked this way in my life. When I get struck, especially when I was younger, the temptation when you're struck and you're wounded by leaders, by friends, by parents, you're struck. You thought when you said yes to the gospel, the life of blessing and favor was yours and then bam, you're struck and it's another believer and it's somebody with leadership over your life and it's somebody that you thought you could trust and boom, you're hit. My reaction in immaturity is to Find every friend I have and talk to them about them. Let me talk to you about the ones that hurt me. Let me tell you my side of the story. I want to talk to my friends about the one that hurt me. We want to gather. We want to rally. What we're really looking for is we're looking for that moment in which our friends go, yeah. Oh, yeah. You are right and they are wrong. And then we can sit back and go, yeah. That's what I was hoping to hear. And then the Lord breaks in and goes, well, that's what you were hoping to hear, but is that the most helpful thing to hear right now? Oh no. <laughs> I know how this works. When you ask me a question, you already know the answer. I'm probably doing the wrong thing. I need to change. What do I need to do? He goes, well, when you're struck, I notice you have this tendency to talk to your friends and your pain I've got a different approach if you'd like to try it. Oh, that means I probably should try it. But Lord, really? Yes. I'd like you to talk to me instead of your friends when you're struck. I'd like you to talk to me. I'd like to talk to you. I'd like to have that conversation with you if that's okay. Okay, I can do that. Boom, you're struck. Okay, God, here we go. Did you see what they did to me? 
Did you see how they hurt me? Can you believe them? I can't believe. I mean, they were just so, I mean, I did this. Then they were like, ah, and I was like, yeah. And they were like, no. And I was like, no. I mean, you saw that, right? Yes, I saw it. What would you like me to do? Oh, I, <laughs> I know what I'd like you to do. Can I tell you? He goes, well, before you tell me what you'd like me to do to them, and because of how they hurt you, what should I do with you when you hurt someone? Ah, oh. okay, mercy, mercy, Lord, mercy. Okay, so now tell me. Well, instead of you telling me what I should do to them, how about I tell you what to tell me? Okay, tell me what to tell you to tell Okay, just tell me stuff. I'm really hurting right now. Tell me stuff. Well, I'd like you to, instead of complaining about them, you used to, when you're hurt, you used to complain about your, your enemies to your friends. Now you've grown up a bit. You're complaining about your enemies to me. That's a little bit better, but I'd like you to go another step if you want to. I'd like you to pray for your enemies. Ah. Ah, okay, Lord, stop them from hurting people. No, 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 no. I'd like you to pray for the ones that hurt you. Pray for your enemies. Pray for them as if you were praying for your own wife and children. I really don't want to. I really don't want to. Yes, but try it. Watch what happens. Okay. Lord, okay, I'm really stuck. Like what? Well, pray that I would increase their ministry and bless them. I don't want you to increase their ministry. I want you to end their ministry. <laughs> I can do that, but that means I'd have to do that to your ministry the next time you hurt somebody. Fair enough. Lord, bless them. <laughs> bless their ministry. Bless their lives. I want to be clear on something. I'm talking about conflict. I'm talking about the normal hurts, the normal wounds that happen in the context of church life. I'm talking about just the normal, painful, awkward, frustrating, sometimes very painful uh, uh, things that happen between believers in conflict. I'm not talking about situations of abuse. I'm not talking about situations that are, that are unhealthy and really need to change for the good of the family and the organization. I'm not talking about that. I'm not advocating that you shut up about your pain and only talk to God. There are Matthew 18 righteous responses that happen in the midst of injustice and severe situations that involve leaders. I'm not talking about that. I want, to be, I want to be very clear. I'm not advocating for silence in every situation. I'm advocating for a heart that grows in love when struck. And the Lord's going, okay. You used to complain about your enemies to your friends. Then you started complaining about your enemies to me. Then you started praying for your enemies. What now? Well, you were right. It worked. How did it work? I don't want to talk about them anymore. They struck me, but I don't want to talk about them right now. What do you want to talk about? I want to talk about me. I want to talk about is there anything I did and can do differently? Is there any way that I can grow in this? Is there... Any way that I can change? Is there anything I can own in this? The Lord goes, good, good. This is how you grow in love when struck. This is how you know love is growing. This is Romans 5. This is the, the joy in tribulation and the joy in trouble. The response that's different today, it's, it's different than the response of your youth. You can see it. Grace is working. Grace is taking hold. Grace and love are transforming your heart, your perspective, the way you see the world. But I look at this chapter and I see a whole other level. I look at this chapter and I see something else entirely. I see the otherworldly, heavenly destination of grace and the power of the Holy Spirit and the love of Jesus working in my heart. I see this destination. She's struck and she does something totally different. 
She goes and talks to God about God. She's just been struck by her leaders. She's just been struck by people she trusted. And her response is to turn and talk to God about God. Her response is to turn and talk to her friends about God. I don't know anybody. I don't think I have a single friend that would evangelize the beauty of Jesus after being struck by their leaders. Do you know anyone like that? And yet, in this chapter, we have a description of a bride of the church in the days to come. The kind of love that the church possesses before Jesus returns to the earth. Before Jesus returns to the earth. This is good news. The good news is that he loves us. The good news is that he loves us even in our weakness. But the good news gets better as we stay with it. Now we see this destination and we go, Lord, could it be me? Could I get to the place where even when I'm struck and wounded by, by leaders, by friends, by people I trust, even when I'm struck and wounded, I could turn and evangelize the beauty of Jesus in a way that provokes hearts to love you and want to seek you out. That is unbelievable. It's beautiful. The Lord goes, this is, the, this is where I want to take the church. This is what more love looks like. This is where the gospel is taking you. This is where the grace of God can go. When we say, God, how far can I go? How much can I love you? The Lord goes, actually, I've got real definition to that if you want it. I, I can show you what it looks like. It looks like the kind of love that's so otherworldly and different that it actually provokes the people around you to go, who is Jesus that you love him like this? I mean, you, you should be complaining. You should be angry. You should be offended. You should be bitter. You don't even want to talk to me about those leaders. You want to talk to me about Jesus. Who is Jesus that you love him this way? That's my prayer for you. My prayer for you is that you would become so infected, so consumed, so overwhelmed by the love of Jesus that even when the circumstances are negative and the wound is deep, the love that flows out of that wound is so profound that your friends around you are bringing their friends and going, clearly this person knows a Jesus that I do not know. Who is he? What is your beloved more than any other beloved? Song of Solomon 5, 9. Oh, fairest among women, meaning, oh, unusual responder to pain. What is your beloved? What is he that you would respond this way? Who is he? And they ask a second question. How can you, where can we find him? But the first question, so amazing. The first question, they go, who is Jesus that you love him this way? Who, you seem to love the real Jesus. And I'm realizing the Jesus that I've worshiped and the Jesus I've loved I don't know that I know him and I don't know that I love him. Tell me who he is. Her answer is so stunning to me. Her answer is so stunning. She just overflows in that moment. The answer that comes out of her heart, the answer that comes out of her heart is so rare. But when I read this, this chapter, I get so excited because as rare as this answer is today in the body of Christ, this is going to be the common normative, every believer before Jesus returns is going to be able to do this. What's the this? The this is to be able to gush effortlessly the details of the beauty of Jesus, not just from memorizing Bible verses, but the truth is in you, you've experienced it, you have a history in it, and it comes out of you. You don't have to peek at the verse. It is flowing out of you with power and authority because you don't just know it, you've lived it, you've experienced it. It's alive in you. You know Jesus like he's a real man from Nazareth, and you can talk about him with detail and power. This is your future. When the Lord looks at you, He doesn't look at you and dream of more stuff. He looks at you and dreams of the day in which the knowledge of Jesus can come flowing out of you in detail, not generalities. 
detail. Then what's even more amazing is that the details that flow out of her are details that she shouldn't be caring about when she's just been wounded. Leaders strike her. Leaders wound her. She doesn't respond with bitterness or offense. Her friends gather around her and go, who is Jesus that you love him so well? She goes, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about Jesus. I was going to pick three of what we could spend the rest of our life studying. We could spend the rest of our life studying this passage. I'm going to pick three that stand out. They're about the first three. She says his head is like the finest gold. In other words, I love his leadership. I love his leadership. His hair. It's beautiful. It's, his hair is wavy. In other words, his dedication to the church, his dedication to me, his eyes, his infinite knowledge, his infinite wisdom, his understanding, his discernment. Do you see it? She, gets, she puts herself out there. She prays a prayer. She says, here I am. Do whatever you want to do. And boom, the presence of Jesus lifts. Boom, the leaders strike her. The first thing out of her mouth, I love his leadership. I love his commitment. I love his wisdom. She is saying the exact opposite of what you think someone should say when struck in an unjust way. Boom! What do you have to say to that? I have to say, I love Jesus' leadership. It's perfect. I love the way he leads me. I trust it. I'm fully confident. I'm safe with him is what she's saying. I'm safe in his leadership. No, you were just struck by his servants. No, you don't understand. I am safe with him. I trust where this is going. I trust where he's taking me. I love his commitment to me. This, I love his faithfulness. She is absolutely unmoved by her circumstances. It's like they didn't even happen. It's like they didn't even touch her. They didn't touch her. Her heart is so consumed. Her heart is so overwhelmed by the love of Jesus. She's throwing out truths about him that are absolutely connected to what just happened to her. But in a very kingdom way that has nothing to do with the logic of this world. She has kingdom logic infused deep within her because of the power of the love of Jesus and the way that it's consumed her. And she goes, oh no, I love his leadership. I love it. I love it. I have this um, burden. I have this concern. I'm troubled. 2 Timothy 3, chapter, verses uh, 1 through 5 Paul says, perilous times before the second coming. Perilous. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. I'm burdened, I'm troubled because we, we live in a time of unprecedented, in my opinion, narcissism, self-absorption, self-protection, consumed with self. And what I never saw coming, I never made the connection, but we're living the connection. I don't know that I ever really made the connection between narcissism and self-consumed, self-protected, self-absorption. I, I never made the connection between love of self and easily offendable. But I'm finding that I live in a society and a culture where young people the more consumed with themselves they get, the more thin their skins become, the more easily offended they become. They have very little ability to bear with even the smallest misunderstanding. Small misunderstandings, a small conflict. When one is consumed with self, 
Love of self, love of money, love of pleasure, not love of God. When one is consumed with self, the smallest of slights, the smallest of misunderstandings, the smallest of conflicts can become an occasion for much rage and much bitterness and much offense. And I'm seeing it as the love of self increases, the rage of man increases, and offense increases, and it's happening all at the same time. It's happening all over my nation and yours. So burdened. And yet in this little Shulamite's heart is the simplest of solutions. It's the way in which the church is going. The world is going one way. And it is going there. Apart from a breakthrough of revival. And what is revival but the gripping of a region in the hands of God. God who is fiercely committed to that region being consumed with the fear of the Lord and his beauty. Revival is that sovereign inbreaking in which everyone in the region is paying attention to God. We live in an hour in which apart from that, more and more people are paying attention to themselves. And the more they do, the more easily offended they become. They're easily hurt. They're easily thrown off. They're easily offended. They're easily angered. Little conflicts become big storms the deeper in love with yourself you are. And the Lord looks at us with kindness. And he goes, this is the way I'm taking you. Pay attention to what's going on. But this is the way I'm taking you. While the world gets more consumed with themselves, my plan for you is for you to be more consumed with me. I'm bringing you to a joyful place in which you almost entirely forget about you and you're lost in me. Is the destination of lost in love the most glorious news? He goes, that's where I'm taking you. That's where she is. She's in the destination of his love is too sweet. His love is too good. I've experienced too much of it to turn back now. That little pain, and it really hurt. But that pain that they inflicted, it can't compare to the love that he's lavished on me all the days of my life. Church, at the end of the age, it's gonna answer the question powerfully. Are we in this for love? Right before his return, the church with great confidence and great joy, it's gonna know. On the other side of pain, on the other side of suffering, on the other side of shaking, on the other side of trouble, and on the other side of the rage of people that were more committed to themselves than they were family and friendship. On the other side of the pain of that is the answer to the question that awaits the church. Is the church in it for love? Right before the second coming, the whole world will know the answer. That is a people in it for love. They're in it for the love of Jesus. They love not their lives even unto the death. They love him. He loves them. The Lord has us on that course. And so the, this love, it's so provoking. So provoking to jealousy. So provoking to hunger. So provoking to desire. They ask the first question, who is he? Then they ask the second question, where can we find him? How do we lay hold of him? How do we lay hold of what you have? I believe at the end of the age, the greatest revival in all of history is coming. Billions of souls are gonna be ushered into the kingdom by the power of the Holy Spirit, but it's the power of the Holy Spirit working in a victorious church. The destiny of the church is victory, but it's not just victory in power. Actually, the book of Revelation talks more about the victory of overcoming, the victory of love, the victory of passing through disappointment, passing through pain, passing through disillusionment, passing through the enemies of cynicism. Some of you, those enemies are actually in front of you in ways that you don't know yet. The enemies of disappointment and disillusionment. You got the great and powerful prophecy in your teens, a few more great and powerful prophecies in your 20s, and then life happens in your 30s in a way you don't expect. 
takes a funny turn in your 40s and the temptation to cynicism, the temptation to draw back, the temptation to settle in. It's easy to believe in great promises at age 18 when you have nothing to lose, but later on in life when it doesn't turn out the way that you thought and it doesn't come in the way, in the time that you thought, and you're grinding it out, and you're laboring it away, and you're wondering how long. It's so easy to settle back and to settle in. I look at my friend Lou Engel. He's a wonder. He's a marvel. He's a sign to me. A father in his 60s whose heart is as faith-filled and childlike and believing in promises. Life has handed him every reason to draw back and settle in. Life has handed him every reason to dial down and relax. And he's in his 60s asking the Lord for grace to dial up. How do I get more intense? How do I, how do I go harder? How do I lay hold of this thing? God spoke revival. He's been going for decades. He's got people around him, I'm sure he has to, it's human nature, that are going, you've been contending for revival for so many years, why don't you just kind of dial down, let the young guys do it, just dial back a bit, I don't even know if it's coming in your lifetime, just settle in. I want to be that 60 year old that goes, what? I want life to be about more than how much stuff and how much position I can get by age 40, I want life to be about being 60, 70, 80, and that twinkle in my eye, and that zeal in my heart, and that joy in the promises, and that zeal of faith that believes is as strong as it ever was, if not stronger. I want to be 80. I want people trying to talk me out of fasting and revival. I want to look at them and smile and go, I, I've been going at it this long. It's coming. I want to be that guy. Age 80, it's coming. You've been saying that for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. What a testimony, actually. Can you, to be that guy that says, you've been saying it's revival coming for 40 years. Yeah, I want to be that guy that believes it more 40 years later. Refuses to draw back. I'm in this for love. I want to be at least. I, I want to be in this for the kind of love that the kind of power and grace that moves in me to the, to the extent that the people around me are going, you know him in a way I don't, and I, you make me want to go for it. You make me want to go for it. Let that be your dream. Let that be your goal. Let that be your pursuit. This kind of love, the kind of love that unsettles the people around you. I don't want my friends, and I don't want believers. I don't want people to get comfortable around me. I want the kind of love that unsettles people. I want, to be, I want to be that kind of person that Jesus has loved so well that the people around me are going, oh, I can't settle in now. I want comrades that are going to be unsettled with me. I want friends that are going to be disrupted. I want friends that are going to be stirred on the inside and want to go somewhere together related to touching this kind of expression of love. I believe we're going to get there. The body of Christ not just my own life being changed by the gospel, but all of our lives together, laying hold of something together. That's why the Lord brought you here. The Lord didn't bring you here because IHOP is awesome. The Lord brought you here because Jesus is alive. He's beautiful. He's glorious. We're a family in this together, and he wants us to lay hold of something together. Come on. The church at the end of the age will be unshakable in love, without offense or bitterness, consumed by the beauty of Jesus, responding to pain and hurt in a manner that provokes many to jealousy and a passionate pursuit of the love of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. The future of the church is a victorious one. It's a glorious one. Not because we're awesome, but because the grace of God is that powerful and the love of Jesus is that sweet. He will have his way. This is gonna end, this is gonna end the way love goes. As I said at the beginning, I'll say it again. The kind of church waiting for Jesus 
Luke 18 is the kind of church filled with faith that is returned, committed to his way, committed to his leadership, refusing to quit, refusing to quit, refusing to yield to bitterness, refusing to yield to cynicism, refusing to roll our eyes at the promises of God, to quietly kind of draw back and quietly settle in. The church at the second coming refuses to entertain that kind of quiet cynicism. The church at the end refuses to quit, longs to lay hold of the fullness of God, to see how far grace can take us, to see how far the love of God can really go. That's the question we want to be asking. Not how much can we get away with. Not how much more we can add to our lives. Not how much stuff he can bless us with. The question that he wants to be alive in our hearts, to burn it within us like a fire. How far can the grace of God take us together? How far can we go as a church? He wants you dreaming about your church, not complaining about it. He wants you dreaming about your leaders and what they could be in the fullness of his love, not complaining about them. He wants you burning with desire and longing related to the possibilities of grace, not complaining about what's not, but longing for what could be. So I've been preaching. If you're going, you know what, you're talking, you've been talking to me this entire time. I want prayer. I want to get out of any agreement with cynicism, any agreement with unbelief and settling in. I don't ever want to settle in. I want to see how far grace can go, and I want to be refreshed in the promises and the love of God today. If that's you and you want prayer, just stand. I want to pray for you. You're feeling it. You're feeling that quiet hardening of the heart. You're feeling that subtle stirring to draw back. You're feeling that quiet temptation to settle for less. And you're, there's something in you, as I've been preaching, you, there's, there's a a greater and stronger voice in you saying, no! How far can I go in grace? How far can the love of Jesus take me? Just before anybody prays for you, just again as we began, just close your eyes and put your hands in your hearts. Just ask him that question in prayer as I pray for you. God, I refuse. I refuse to give cynicism a door into my heart. I refuse the complaining, bitterness. I don't want it to have any place in my life. I don't want to grow more consumed with me. I want to be consumed with you. I want to be consumed by your love. I want to be apprehended. I want to be I want you to take hold of me in a fresh way. Take hold of my heart in a fresh way. Take hold of my joy in a fresh way. I want to believe again, but with greater faith. I want to believe again, but with greater expectation. I want to believe again, but with a greater sense of what I'm believing for. Not just more, as the world defines more, but I want more love. I want more of what love looks like. I want more of the perspective and clarity about what life's about. I want a clear sense of what life is really about. I want the fruit of love. I want more of it. I want the fruit of love to, to fill every space of my life. I want the kind of love that provokes my neighbors. I want the kind of love that provokes complacency out of my friends. I want the kind of love that shakes and disturbs and disrupts and provokes and awakens. I want something more than I have. I thank you for all that you've done in my life. I th Thank you for everything you've done. Not a one, not a bit of it I've deserved. But God, I'm asking, I'm reaching, I'm crying out again. I want something more of the fruit of love that I see in Scripture. I want it in me. I want it in my family. I want it in my church. I want it in my friends. I want it in my nation. I want to see what the love of Jesus can do in everyone I know. God, I'm asking for more. I'm asking that the longing and the vision for more would grip this room and not let go. In the name of Jesus, I pray. God, help us. Not just a conference and a sweet time, but let us leave gripped. Let us leave with the kind of vision that bothers us when no one's looking. 
that leaves us restless and longing for something more. Let's have the worship team go ahead and come on up. Holy Spirit, stir us, disrupt us, that the rest of this conference, the rest of the night, next week when nobody's around, disrupt us. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you.